many people are interested in correlations and in, uh, in interacting systems. And one of the methods that has been uh, used extensively is dynamical cluster theory and, and extensions. Uh, but uh, the even more difficult problem is to include the effect of disorder in correlated system. And disorder is always uh, always present. So uh, today we are fortunate to have with us uh, a speaker who has, uh, since her PhD, has worked on this problem of uh, localization and uh, localization due to disorder and localization due to, to uh, interactions. And then she's been involved uh, in uh, developing uh, software uh, and also in comparing with uh, various uh, real systems like uh, organics. So she has participated in the Alps project. She has contributed to, she has some uh, papers on uh, dual fermions with her in her postdoctoral uh, work. And uh, so uh, she is now a faculty at um, uh, Middle Tennessee University. And we are really uh, very happy to have her. So please uh, welcome uh, Anna Terletska. Thank you. Thank you, Andre Marie, for such a nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me. It's a true pleasure and honor for me to be here with you today. And thank you for opportunity to present our work. As you and Andre, Andre Marie mentioned, that this is going to be on correlated system due to strong electron interaction and disorder using dynamical cluster approximation. So, um, uh, before I go on, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators. So, first part of the talk, uh, the, the, the first part of the talk will be uh, with the results done together with Emmanuel Gall from University of Michigan and Thomas Meyer from Oak Ridge National Lab. Some of the work is also continuation of my collaboration with my former PhD advisor, uh, Vlad Dobrosavljevic. And second part of the talk on disorder will be done, uh, will be, has been done in collaboration with uh, many institutions in the United States and abroad, and I just uh, point out their names, uh, but, but I will not go through the uh, names uh, to save some time. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, since this is colloquium talk, I will start with, and I know there are some students in the audience, so I will start with some general intro, uh, why quantum is important, and uh, what are the opportunities for students and for researchers in the field, and also will mention what are the theoretical challenges we are facing as a theorist or computer scientist in, in, in the area. And then I will present you three major results on uh, how using so-called quantum quantum embedding method like dynamical cluster approximation, we can study one of the fundamental problems in correlated system like electron localization. So um, over the last uh, uh, century, right, uh, so there has been a huge development in quantum material research. Numerous quantum materials have been discovered. Uh, I just put pictures of a few of them. Of course, this list is not exhausting a list, but um, uh, this includes materials with strong correlation effect like superconductors, topological materials, spin liquids, uh, graphene system, and more recently two-dimensional materials. Uh, this uh, variety of these quantum materials features different uh, exotic states of matter and properties, but one of the characteristic uh, features that unites all of these materials is so-called emergent behavior, and this can be due to strong interplay between shards, spin, or orbital decrease of freedom, or it can be due to topology or dimensional confinement. Obviously, these materials present some interesting exotic states of matter, uh, which are not just interesting from science scientific point of view, but they can do some useful things in real life applications. So quantum materials, one of the uh, reasons that people are so much also interested in quantum materials because there are many potential technological application of them, including energy transmission or developing more efficient solar cells or different optoelectronic and switching devices or building better magnets or even application to uh, quantum computing. So our task as a quantum uh, uh, or condensed matter researchers is uh, to look for the origin of uh, origin of these emerging states of matter so we can uh, control them on a more sophisticated level and that can potentially lead us to the rational uh, quantum design of, uh, of these materials. 
I often tell to my students that this is really a golden time to be a student, either undergraduate or master degree or graduate student, because there are so much effort in quantum land uh, or qu capturing quantum states of matter from quantum materials to quantum computing. And this is uh, these efforts just all across the globe with billions of investment in, uh, in, in quantum initiatives uh, through uh, in different countries and continents. Um, of course, quantum material research has become became a prime research also in the uh, United States. In particular, a National Science Foundation defines this as one of 10 big ideas. So this is a primary research in NSF and Department of Energy, Department of Defense. And you can see this just from the examples of how many quantum centers are growing like mushroom all, mushroom all across the United States with wonderful opportunities for students, faculty, as well as postdocs to get involved in this exciting area of research. This has this type of research has been also identified as a, a national uh, on a national level uh, through the National Quantum Initiative Act. But also I like to point out to my students that if you don't like to work in academia but prefer industry, this is also a golden time because this is a unique time in the history when industry and academia are working together to capturing or to harnessing quantum states of matter uh, in, in different systems. So what is my uh, tiny corner in this global states of matter? So in my research group, uh, I study quantum materials with strong electron correlations and disorder. And um, uh, by correlations, I mean the fact that the motion of one electron is influenced, uh, strongly influenced, influenced by the presence of another electrons. For example, if you want to calculate some density-density correlation function, it's not going to be a product of density of electron and state uh, at position R times a product of the uh, electron in uh, of density of electron sta uh, sta uh, state uh, position R prime. It's it's beyond. This is a type of problem when you have to go beyond factorization, which makes things uh, interesting, but at the same time complicated on theoretical point of view, because you have to go really beyond series like that we learn in our solid state classes, like Hartree-Fock theory, or beyond independent electron motion, or beyond single particle approximation. At the same time, electron localization problems or correlations affect problem by challenging, they are introducing very interesting uh, scientific uh, 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 areas to explore. For example, uh, these materials, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the statement from Phil Anderson really fits uh, this type of materials where uh, in his famous papers, more is different. You look at this emergent behavior where new phenomena when many object interacts is very different, uh, fundamentally different from its constituent parts. And you can never get the uh, uh, global collective behavior based on looking at the behavior on individual parts. And this collective behavior or emerging behavior due to correlations can lead to very exotic uh, 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 states of matter. This can lead to, uh, lead to complex phase diagrams, like for example, this phase diagram showing for cuprates with different colors repre representing different uh, states of matter, which can be easily tuned by either temperature or doping or pressure. Uh, correlations between uh, uh, constituents in the material can lead to different type of ordering. This can be charge ordering, orbital ordering. And of course, it can lead to, lead to electron localization via metal insulated transition in such system. So obviously there are many effects of strong correlations in materials. And today I would like to focus on one of such effects, in particular correlation-driven electron localization or, uh, and metal insulated transition, which as turns out is one of the fundamental feature seen across a lot of uh, families of correlated system. So let me just give you a very quick uh, overview um, what type of electron localization I'm going to look at, uh, at in this talk. So generally speaking, if you don't break translational symmetry, electron localization can be driven by two routes. Electron-electron interaction, which we often refer to more transition or more Hubbard localization, and it uh, 
it happens in clean system, but usually happens in materials uh, where uh, which that that features very features strong electron electron correlation. These materials represent a big chunk of our periodic system. So these are system with uh, partially filled d and f orbitals and they are characterized and uh, this mode insulating behavior is characterized by the opening of the gap uh, in the density of states. Another route to drive electron localization due to some type of due to correlations effect, and particular here correlation are driven due to the scattering of electrons uh, due to disorder, is Anderson localization or Anderson transition. So this is disorder driven electron localization, which happened into si in system due to some imperfection present in the material. So now electrons as shown here are not moving in periodic crystal, but they are moving in this random potential, and that. Uh, creates sources of scattering of electrons of these impurities, which can eventually lead to some spatial confinement of electrons over some region of space, as shown by this wave function envelope, indicating that, uh, that electrons can be found, uh, mostly found in this region of space, and then uh, not found in other region of space, so spatial confinement of electron. Unlike, unlike mode localization, Anderson localization is not characterized by the gap opening in the density of states, is characterized by the mobility gap opening of the density of states. So there is an energy level which separates localized and extended states, and as you introduce more disorder into the system, this mobility edge will cross the Fermi level, and the, the system will become Anderson insulation. So in today's story, I would like to show you that electron correlations due to different nature, the electron-electron interaction due to disorder, can lead to different nature of uh, insulating behavior in materials. This can be mod insulating, bad in, band insulating, or Anderson insulating. And I will demonstrate you how dynamical cluster approximation can successfully describe these different scenarios of electron localization. So, uh, uh, so now let me move to the another part of my outline uh, of the outline of my talk is like uh, and discuss why uh, uh, studying this electron localization or studying quantum is challenging. So when we are talking about this emergent behavior in either strongly correlated system or disordered system, we are talking about many like ten to the twenty three correlated or interacting particles, right? So problem becomes very quickly, just with few uh, uh, ingredients, to, uh, problem becomes uh, numerically prohibitively very uh, difficult. So, and we are running into a problem of solving it. So I think the best, um, uh, I think the good, in this scenario, a good quote would be from Paul Dirac, who said that while we know how to solve this correlated system, right, uh, a system, we know how to write Schrodinger equation because the behavior of these materials is just driven by quantum mechanical effect, right? But the problem is that the difficulty lies only the fact that these laws lead to equations too complex to be solved, right? So what we need instead, it's becoming desirable that approximate practical methods applying quantum mechanics should be developed without too much computation. So to solve this uh, this NPR problem, we will need uh, to uh, develop some approximate method that can help us to reveal the phys physics that we are looking at. And indeed, there have been a lot of progress reached in developing approximate practical methods to deal with many body correlated systems. So uh, I would just say that in general, one can look at this that there are two major routes. One is you can take a route to go and, and construct approximate solution to the Hamiltonian. And that approximate solution can be really, really close to exact depending on the system. Uh, so example of such approximation is include that is represents is uh, density functional theory, which works really, really well for a weakly correlated or non not correlated system. Or you can and it, and the result of the theory can be compared directly with the experiment. Or you can take another route which will be described in this talk. And instead of con constructing approximate solution to the Hamiltonian, one can construct approximate Hamiltonian. So we are looking for uh, uh, um, 
qualitative instead of quantitative physics here, right? So we, based on the experimental observation, one can use this Okama approach and construct model Hamiltonian of the, choose the simplest ingredients that are responsible for the phenomena we want to study and propose simple Hamiltonian, solve this Hamiltonian, and at the end compare with experiment, see if, uh, uh, if, uh, if that uh, approximation can infer the original problem. Well, and solving the simple Hamiltonian is also a challenge. And uh, um, over the last uh, decades, there has been a huge uh, 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 breakthroughs in developing numerical method. So uh, one can say, well, just take a big uh, computer and just solve your problem on a big computer. Well, increasing computer power alone is not enough. We have to be smarter than this because, for example, because uh, increasing uh, your uh, number of components you are looking at in your system, you are, have exponentially growing Hilbert space. So, uh, for example, on 300,000 CPU core hours, you can calculate 40 electrons, adding one electron uh, will, uh, will require doubling of the capacity. Okay, so uh, just increasing computer power is not enough. We do benefit from having access to huge supercomputers, but we have to be smarter than this. And uh, in in the area, we heavily rely on the on the development of uh, numerical techniques, many body numerical techniques. So uh, here on the right, I have some acronyms. So please don't get scared of them. This is just to demonstrate you that the development of better computers also help us to develop better numerical algorithms and test them. And there has been a huge breakthrough over the recent couple of decades in developing various many body numerical techniques. And they can be divided in different groups like Monte Carlo techniques, diagrammatic uh, techniques, uh, quantum embedding methods that I'm going to discuss today, uh, renormalization technique, and so on. So uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, that the progress in the in the field of strongly correlated system heavily relies on ongoing development of various many body uh, techniques and algorithms, which is uh, absolutely essential to uh, reach uh, further progress in the community. And uh, this uh, these efforts have been undertaken uh, by Simon's collaboration on many electron problem, where different numerical methods have been used to uh, compare uh, the results for the Hubbard model, one of the simplest models used to study strongly correlated system, and benchmark the results in different parameter regime. So if you're interested in some more details, there have been several papers published by this group on benchmarking different numerical tools uh, to study this uh, two-dimensional Hubbard model. So in today's story, I would like to show you how we can use one of such tools like quantum cluster embedding method, in particular dynamical cluster approximation, to tackle the problem of localization. And this will be mod insulated, charge order, and Anderson insulated. So let me start with the mod, ins mod insulated behavior. So why mod insulating behavior? So mod metal insulated tra uh, uh, transition or interaction driven metal insulated transition is truly a central a phenomena in strongly correlated system. And here I show the uh, pictures of different families of strongly correlated system. And you can see each of them is featuring this mod metal insulated transition. So this include transition metal oxides to deorganic salts, high temperature superconductors and strontium rutenite systems, where metal in mod metal insulated transition can be either driven by uh, changing pressure or temperature or you can change the doping of the system okay so to study such a uh, 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 metal insulated transition, uh, Hubbard model has been commonly employed, and it's given by this Hamiltonian, where everybody knows this Hamiltonian, uh, where the first term is just a hopping of electrons bet between different sides, and the second term is a approximation that it used in the Hubbard model that interactions are fully screened, so electrons only interact when they meet at a given site only. Right. So this simple model, despite its simplicity, has been extensively studied to study different questions associated with correlations effect in quantum materials, including mod metal insulated transition, quantum mag uh, magnetism, superconductivity, pseudo gap, Lipschitz transition, charge ordering, and stripes. And I put some references here in case you are interested. But today I'm going to focus on mod metal insulated transition. So uh, 
uh, for this, I would like, because this is a colloquium, so I would like to just uh, remind ourselves how we approach this uh, problem from uh, the textbook uh, uh, knowledge that we have. So in our textbook in solid state physics, we learned Ben theory of solids, where the distinguish be distinction between metal and insulator is really built on the Ben theory, where for insulated, you have a gap in the density of state, and for metals, there is no gap in the density of state. This this theory is built on the independent electron approximation, so it's really good for uh, some simple metals and some band insulators. But when applying this to some prototypical example of correlated mod insulated like nickel oxide, when applying this model, we see that density of state at the Fermi level doesn't exhibit the gap which is experimentally seen, okay? And uh, the problem with it, and the, the, the reason it doesn't capture this uh, uh, transition is due to that improper treatment of strongly correlation effects, okay? So how can we incorporate strong correlation effect into the analysis and capture more metal insulated transition? One of the a uh, very celebrated series that was able to capture uh, and, and solve the puzzle of mod metal insulator transition uh, was dynamical mean field theory developed by Gabi Kotler, Dieter Wolher, and Antoine George. And this theory is a Green's function approach. So it's, a, uh, it's not like a DFT, DFT, which used density functional theory, which uses a uh, wave function approach. Uh, uh, it's a Green's function approach, so it allows to calculate Green's function from which you can extract some experimentally measured quantities. And uh, the correlations between electrons is encoded in this quantity self-energy, which uh, describe how your Green's function if uh, it deviates from non-interacting Green's function. Okay, but the big, uh, the basic idea uh, behind the MFT. Uh, can be uh, the intuition behind uh, building DMFT uh, can be obtained by just looking and just simple mean field theory, the ones that we all learn in our uh, statistical solid state physics class, where we look at the ways mean field theory for Eisen model, where the original lattice is mapped into the impurity embedded in some effective field. Uh, which is static field, uh, which is just a number, and you just have to determine itself consistently. So this approximation, we know it is exact in infinite dimension. And uh, for quantum case, a dynamical mean field theory, a dynamical mean field theory can be actually considered as a quantum extension of mean field theory, where you map original lattice into the impurity embedded in effective medium, and this effective medium is described by this self-energy sigma, which contains information about the correlation effect of the medium, but unlike the mean field static mean field series, the quantum effects are hidden in this dynamic quantity as function of frequency, right? Or you can do Fourier transform, it be function of time. So dynamic and mean field theory, it's not static, it's dynamic, and it captures dynamics of a, dynamics of an electron at a given side. So a given side can be either zero occupied, um, it can be singly occupied, with spin up or spin down, or can be doubly occupied. This is a, the time when you really sample the correlation between electrons. By construction, because this is single side approximation, so this is local approximation, so it still neglects any spatial uh, fluctuation in the system, but at the same time, it takes a dynamic fluctuation into account. Okay, so applying this approximation to Haber model, we can construct the phase diagram. So in, in Haber model, in metal insulated transition can be driven either by temperature or interaction strengths U, or in experiment, it's equivalent to changing the, the pressure in the system. So if you fix the temperature and change U and plot density of states obtained using a uh, dynamical mean field theory, you will see that density of states uh, changes from metal to correlated metal with this characteristic three peak structure and to the mod insulator characterized with the gap opening in the density of states. 
One, of course, can do this analysis for other temperatures and construct the full temperature U phase diagram, where for small interaction U, you have a metal, and for large interaction, you have a mod insulator. In between, you have this first order uh, mod metal insulator transition, and these lines delineate the uh, coexistence region of this transition. The first order transition, as expected, ends up at the second order continuous uh, transition with a critical temperature temperature Tc, about which you have a crossover, right? So to demonstrate that this is also really a correlation driven metal insulator transition, one can look at the quantities like quasi-particle peak or quasi-particle weight, which is inversely proportional to the effective mass, and plot it as function of U and see that quasi-particle weight is decreasing as you go from metal to insulator, it's, and it is suppressed, significantly suppressed as you go to the insulating regime, indicating that you are in the regime where correlation makes this uh, electron behave like very heavy quasi-particles. Another signature that this is really a correlation driven phase transition is if you look at double occupancy as function of U. So as you go to the insulating regime, electron like to be localized because it costs too much energy to have two electrons in a given sum. Okay, so this is the results, well-known results that have been obtained with dynamical mean field theory. And one question can, one can ask, what about spatial correlations, momentum uh, dependence in self-energy of other quantities case that we have neglected? So the simple way to get in a uh, spatial correlation into analysis is to instead uh, map your system into impurity in the effective medium, map your system into the finite cluster embedded in effective medium. So one can construct a cluster dynamical mean field theory. And you can do this either in real space, we call it cellular DMFT or CDMFT, or the cluster can be constructed in momentum space. So we call this DCA, okay? So within this approximation, now self-energy, some, some momentum dependence of self-energy is recovered. Of course, this is only within the size of the cluster. So we are capturing some short range correlation uh, within the cluster, but still long range correlation in DCA or CDMFT are still treated on a mean field level. At the same time, this approximation does become exact as you increase cluster size to infinity, and it becomes, uh, uh, it recovers DMFT when cluster size equal to one, and it has a small parameter one or NC. So it's a controllable approximation. Okay. So we recently, we have applied this method this, uh, this method to look how non-local spatial fluctuation uh, affect uh, the, uh, the metal insulated transition in Haber model. So these are the results for the temperature U phase diagram. So these are the results I have shown to you for DMFT. And now here in red and green, we have results obtained in our group by DCA, two by two, the smallest cluster uh, DCA. So this is a cluster in momentum space. And here I show data obtained by Andre Marie Tremblay uh, uh, for two by two CDMFT, uh, um, a real space cluster analysis. So we can see that including short range correlation or going beyond singles a local approximation, we see that the critical value of U at which metal to insulated transition occurs is significantly suppressed. The same happens, the same suppression is observed for critical temperature Tc and the coexisting region is shrinking. Okay, so we do see a significant effect on the local correlation on the metal insulated transition uh, for the Hubbard model. Recently, we have been working on going beyond two by two cluster with DCA and going for much larger clusters. And so on the right, I'm showing you results obtained for 0.2 temperature and 0.1 as function of cluster size, we see there is a strong suppression of critical value of U as we increase cluster size. And um, I want to mention that recently this problem has attracted a lot of attention, not just with DCA or, or with cluster extension of DMFT, but other numerical methods that have been developed, in particular with the, the, the diagrammatic uh, D gamma A or or this is diagrammatic extension of DMFT, which allows to take into account long range interaction that uh, uh, DCA uh, uh, is not able or cluster extension cannot. And if you can look at this, if you see, look at this picture,
picture we see is that once you take into account long range interaction, we again observe a very strong suppression of the critical value of U at which metal twin selected transition occurs. And as pointed out by this paper, the beautiful paper by Thomas Schaffer, that um, Oh, this was taken from also earlier paper. It was shown that the origin or the nature of such strong suppression is due to strong antiferromagnetic spin fluctuation, uh, which are more dominant at lower temperature and they have very long, they are long range. So this is a uh, um, correlation length shown here, how it changes with temperature. So indicating that in our DCA calculation, we really, really have to go to larger clusters to, to, uh, to, to capture uh, this uh, small U behavior for metal insulated transition. These results are uh, consistent with most recent development of uh, uh, Fyodor Simkovich, um, on, uh, when they applied diagrammatic quantum Monte Carlo, where they again have shown that once you go, uh, uh, they have shown that uh, uh, in Hubbard model, uh, uh, in two-dimensional Hubbard model, there is a strong suppression of uh, uh, metal insulated transition once you are able to go beyond a DMFT level. Okay, so I have shown you so far more insulating behavior and how we can use uh, uh, dynamical cluster approximation to capture non-local uh, spatial correlation, which uh, effect which uh, are, uh, seem to be very important for capturing properly metal insulated transition in certain uh, uh, system, in particular in Hubbard model in 2D. Now I would like to go to another uh, type of localization, and this is due to charge ordering. And for this, we're going to consider extended Hubbard model. So. Over the last couple of decades, there have been also different kinds of uh, quantum, novel quantum materials developed, and description of them is not possible with the Hubbard model. So there is a significant need to go beyond Hubbard, approxim Hubbard model approximation and to take into account different types of degrees of freedom which have been neglected uh, originally in the system. So this includes going beyond fully screen interaction and going beyond local uh, interaction by including no local uh, interaction between electrons. Also, uh, another extension would include going to include um, multi-orbital degrees of freedom, or spin degrees of freedom of phonons, and of course disorder. Because uh, these degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom, are absolutely necessary uh, to describe novel effects that have been found in materials experimentally, like charge ordering, orbital selective mode transition, Hans metal, uh, Weyli semi metal, and of course Anderson transition. So let me start now uh, with a non-local Coulomb interaction. So this is one step beyond Haber model. And I will start first with why non-local interactions are important. So there have been many uh, uh, experimental and serious results showing that non-local interaction between electrons, we call them V, are not small in certain systems. This includes uh, for example, add atoms on semiconducting surfaces like uh, these materials, where it has been shown in this paper that non-local interaction Vs are approximately from 30 to 60% of local interaction U. So they are really not small numbers that one can uh, easily, uh, one should neglect. Another effect that non-local Coulomb interaction can bring into the picture is a strong screening effect. So in this system, graphene, silicon, and benzene, it has been shown that non-local interaction V can significantly reduce the local interaction U in, uh, leading to the system behaving more like metallic-like instead of insulating-like. And finally, non-local interaction can uh, bring in a new type of ordering or new type of insulating behavior through the charge ordering, which is not uh, possible to get, well, uh, it's to charge ordering, let me stop there. <laughs> so um, to, to, to model this behavior and this effect into our analysis, we have done one step beyond a Hubbard model. So we included non-local inter-site interaction between nearest neighbors, and we call this term V-term, okay? So we have our local uh, Hubbard U, and now we have non-local nearest neighbor interaction V. So in this simple model, which is just baby step beyond Hubbard model, one can host two types of insulating behavior. This can be, as I mentioned before, when U is local interaction, U is a dominant energy scale, then you will have more insulating behavior, which would suppress the double occupancy at given site, 
or if the overall effect of nearest neighbors and non-local interaction prevails over local interaction u, uh, you will have this checkerboard arrangement of electrons uh, through at every other side. So you can have a charge order insulator. To, to, uh, to capture this numerically, we actually follow André Marie's uh, paper on DCA, and we also constructed a broken symmetry solution for the Hubbard model half filling within DCA. So this is the result shown for two by two cluster. And this is a phase diagram for non-local interaction V versus local interaction U at a given temperature and a given uh, cluster size. So at a given V, as you change no, uh, local interaction U, you go from metal to more insulator, the, the scenario that I have described in the previous part of the talk. But once you go and uh, once you go upwards, you change the local interaction V, you are going to charge order phase. To detect this charge order phase, uh, we calculated the stagger density, which is just the density of electron difference, uh, the density difference between electrons, uh, between the density of electrons at site A minus at site B. So when there is a uniform charge distribution, this delta n is of course zero, but it becomes finite once you go to the charge order phase. And in this charge order phase, we see that depending on the value of V, you can have either charge order metal or a nice charge order insulator the gap opening in the density of states. So obviously charge ordering, so charge ordering is another route to of interaction driven localization in uh, in correlated system. So um, since this uh, extended Hubbard model can host two types of localization, charge order insulated, mod insulated, both of them are featuring a gap in the density of states. It was interesting for us to also look at the correlations effect. And to look at that, we look at the imaginary part of the local density of, uh, imaginary part of self energy, which is actually the measure of correlations. And we find that uh, the behavior is completely different for different insulators. For mod insulator, imaginary part of self energy is large. So this is an indication of strong correlation and it increases with interaction mu. However, for Charge order insulating major, major part of self energy is small and it's going to zero, indicating that charge order insulator is more like a weak correlations effect. It's more like band like insulator, not uh, definitely not like a mod insulator. Uh, another thing that we explored in extended Haber model is those screening effects that I mentioned that are important for certain type of materials. And uh, to demonstrate that in our method we can capture the screening effect, we follow the scenario described in this paper by Sasha Lindstenstein and uh, Misha Kartnelson, where they have shown that in some parameter regime, one can model the extended Haber model with local and local interaction V by some effective Hubbard model with some renormalized interaction U star. And these renormalized interaction U star are reduced uh, as a reducing local interaction U due to some prefactor V. Okay, to demonstrate this, we have picked some values of U here above mod metal insulated transition. So U is equal to 4.5, and we are changing the values of V. And we are plotting imaginary part of self energy as function of omega for different values of V. So uh, we, uh, and this is shown by open circles, right? So we see that imaginary part of self energy as we increase in non local interaction V is reducing, so less correlated effect. And here with dash lines, we show that we can exactly reproduce this behavior by doing a calculation for Haber model with some renormalized interaction U star. Of course, this approximation gets worse and worse as you approach the charge order transition because this mapping is not uh, valid in closer to the transition. But it clearly demonstrates that the local interaction V significantly reduce local interaction V due to the screening effect. Another thing that I want to point out that like in Haber models, there have been a lot of benchmarking done uh, because, uh, to, to, to see where a different method works and which method works better in, in which parameter regime. So similar analysis have been done also in uh, for extended Haber model. And this plot is very busy and I have taken this professor from Professor Katanin work. Uh, but the main point I just want to highlight with these um, highlighted curves. So for extended Haber model, the local approximation or the local uh, uh, approximation is EDMFT. 
And the result was EDMFT are shown by this highlighted yellow region. When, uh, and of course, efforts have been built to go beyond local approximation EDMFT using different type of approximation, including our DCA results. So here I highlight that our DCA results are very much consistent with other non-local approximation like dual bosons or uh, two particle irreducible uh, uh, approach. Showing basically the message here is that even for extended Hubbard model within some parameter regime is absolutely also cr crucial to go beyond local single side approximation and capture non-local effects. So with this, I finish my two present uh, two uh, discussion of two type of electron localization, and now I would in co strongly correlated systems, and now I would like to switch the gears and go to disordered system, which is another direction that I'm pursuing in my research. So why are we interested in disordered system? We are interested in them because no material is perfect, right? So disorder in some way or another, in one form or another, are up. Uh, often or uh, sometimes unavoidable, unavoidable in materials. And this can be in the form of vacancy or some impurities, some type of substitutional atoms and et cetera. And it can result as a due, during the material synthesis, or it can be intentionally introduced into the system due to the doping effect. Okay. And they, uh, there are certain class of materials where disorder plays absolutely crucial role. This includes alloy materials, doped semiconductors, or amorphous solids. So taking into account a disorder is very critical. And as I mentioned in my introduction, disorder can lead to Anderson localization and with a spatial confinement of electron within some region of space. And recently we have shown in series of papers and it has been realized by other groups that uh, this Anderson localization due to disorder can be used as a powerful controlling tool to manipulate the properties of materials. For example, there have been recent studies that Anderson insulator can be used for topological Anderson insulating system, where the gap is not due to the topology, but due to the mobility gap in the density of states. Um, experiments by um, Dr. Kanoda from Japan group have shown that once you uh, bombard your sample and study a 2D Hubbard model with disorder, for example, you will see that some quantum critical regimes that has been observed in clean system is much more pronounced in disordered system. Of course, disorder is very important for semiconducting materials, in particular for intermediate band semiconductors, where localization of electrons and in this intermediate uh, phase can, um, uh, can control the photo emissions effect and photoconducting effect. So this is important for developing more efficient solar cells. And of course, electron localization due to disorder is another mechanism to localize electron in the system. And I just want to mention that this is not only for electric system, uh, disorder driven localization is present in any uh, uh, disordered uh, way uh, uh, medium, for example, phonon localization. So to study this, we again start with the simplest model possible. So we consider Anderson model, which consists of this hopping term. And uh, the disorder is modeled by this local term VI, uh, which stands for the disorder potential. Okay, And depending on the problem you want to study, this disorder potential VI can be modeled by different distribution. One commonly uses box distribution, which just shows you the fluctuation of the local potential that is introduced by randomness into the system. Or if you study binary alloy, then it will be uh, given by this uh, distribution uh, where uh, A atoms get substituted with B atom and there is some concentration of them, okay? So not surprisingly, but there have been effective medium methods developed for disordered system. In fact, they have been developed even earlier than DMFT for strongly correlated systems, in particular in 70s. And one of the most commonly uh, used uh, effective medium approximation for disordered system is a coherent potential approximation or CPA. And the idea is very similar to the idea of construction uh, DMFT. So you have your original 
original problem, in this case, disorder problem, and you map this into some effective medium problem, which is characterized by this effective medium self-energy sigma, which again is uh, local in space, but non-local in time. So it's function of frequency. And to determine the self-energy sigma, because this is a really impure disordered problem, so you put a real impurity in this effective medium, demanding that there are no further scattering on average from this impurity in this medium. In other words, that the Green's function of this red uh, shown here, impurity disorder average Green function of this impurity in this effective medium is the same as the local Green's function of this effective medium, okay? So, uh, by construction is a local approximation just as DMFT, and it has been shown again by Detail Walher and uh, uh, shown that it becomes exact uh, as DMFT in infinite dimension limit. However, like Anderson localization itself uh, also involves multiple scattering effect if you have many impurities in the system. So obviously coherent potential approximation, a single side approximation is not able to capture this phenomena. So one instead can go again, instead of looking at single impurity, one can map the problem into the cluster embedded in effective medium. And originally this approximation had been developed by Mark Jarrell and Krishna Murti. Uh, and this is a reference to their paper. So as in DMFT, with this kind of approach, you can capture some non-local spatial correlation of scattering within the cluster size, and you hope to recover more and more exact physics as you increase cluster size uh, uh, of the system. So to, to demonstrate you the application of this effective medium method in particular dynamical cluster approximation, we will consider this Anderson model in 3D where we know the exact solution because Anderson localization is dimension dependent phenomena. Uh, and we know that in three dimensions, there is some critical value of disorder strengths at which there is a clear transition from metal to insulator. So here are the results for obtained with dynamical uh, DCA or dynamical cluster approximation for the box disorder distribution and for binary. So let's look at the box distribution. We know from the uh, other uh, methods that there is a metal insulated transition around 16 point or 17, you can say a critical value of disorder 17. But if you look at the average density of states, would you observe that as expected that average density of state just broadens due to the disorder? But there is no uh, fundamental or some significant features signaling that there is a metal to insulated transition by looking at this average density of states. Well, let's look what a binary disorder brings us. So here uh, on the top panel, I show CPA results. So this is single side approximation versus DCA, finite cluster calculation results. So we, we clearly see that DCA brings us some finite structure into the analysis. These are not artifacts. This is like what you would even get with exact analyzation results. And this is not surprising because CPA as a single side approximation just averages things out. So it smooths this finite structure in the density of states and DCA by uh, including non-local special correlation recovers them and also recovers some tailing uh, near the band edges. One can do, uh, so this is binary alloy system. So this is like having two delta functions. So you can increase this local potential. So at some point, your system will go through some trivial band splitting transition, which is like, this is already the transition where you have A band and B band. And one can look at uh, how much this band splitting uh, uh, depends on the uh, cluster size. So this is what is shown here on the bottom page. Here's the average density of state at the band center as function of disorder. We see that it, the average density of state at the band center goes to zero at some value of disorder, indicating that uh, band splitting has occurred. And we see that uh, the, uh, the value of disorder strength at which uh, this okay at the point which this occurs strongly depend on the cluster size. So single side approximation is not enough to capture this band splitting transition. All right, but I'm interested, we are interested in about electron localization, right? Just looking at the density of states, we clearly don't see any signatures of Anderson localization in such systems. So 
uh, how do we detect this localized state due to the disorder? And answer is actually coming from one of Phil Anderson's uh, famous uh, uh, papers, where he mentioned that there is a very important fundamental truth about random systems we must always keep in mind. No real atom is an average atom. Okay, so so far we have adopted the point of view of average globally averaging over disorder, but maybe instead we should look at the atom locally. Okay, so to demonstrate that uh, there is truth to this, right here on the left, I'm plotting globally average density of states that we have seen, which doesn't show any signatures of electron localization due to disorder. And on the right, I'm plotting the average, the local density of states at the given side for weak and strong disorder, right? We clearly see that local density of states starts to bring some information for us, useful information for us. In particular, for weak disorder, we see that local density of states really smooth function of frequencies, a continuous function, beautiful function. However, as you go to strong disorder, we see that the local density of states starts to behave like a set of delta function, right? So unlike average or global uh, uh, density of state, which is just smooth function of frequency all the time, local density of states qualitatively changes upon localization. It goes from continuous to a discrete uh, function. Okay, so there have been more uh, insight uh, from other series which in, into this behavior where it has been suggested that uh, Anderson localization can actually might be detected by looking at the probability distribution function of this local density of states. So to, and in particular, to demonstrate that there is some truth to this, uh, I, I here on the left, I'm plotting probability distribution function of the local density of states at weak disorder. And we can see that the most probable value, right, the peak of this probability distribution function and the average value, they coincide, right? So the most probable value and the average value are the same. However, once you go to the strong disorder, we see that the average value is here, while what you would measure experimentally most probable value, a typical value is here, right? They are very different, right? We see the distribution is not Gaussian anymore, so it's not self-averaging phenomena anymore. And we see that most probable value tends to go to zero while average value is still fine. Right. So bottom line is that uh, Anderson localization is a non self averaging phenomena where we really have to distinguish between measuring most probable and the average value. So the reason that CPA and DCA where we look at the average or globally average quantities was failing to capture Anderson localization because they look at this quantity, which by no means represents the most probable value or the typical quantity uh, in the system. So to incorporate these ideas into the effective medium approach and modify the CPA approximation, Vlad Dobrosavlyevich, he was my he's my PhD advisor, has introduced has uh, 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 pioneered the so-called typical medium approach, and the idea is that once you calculate your uh, disorder average Green's function in your self-consistency loop, he suggested instead of calculating the average, linearly average Green's function, calculate the geometrically average Green's function, which is approximation for that most typical or the typical value or most probable value that one would like to study. Okay, but uh, so this was done in 2003 uh, on a single site TMT approximation. My contribution to the field was to extend this to a finite cluster because Anderson localization by no means is a, a, a local approximation. Okay, so let me show you some results. So on the left, I'm showing you the evolution of the average and the typical density of states as function of disorder strengths. Average density of state is shown in dashed line and typical is shown by as a shaded region. And as what we would expect that below the transition, typical and average will be finite, but above the transition, we expect that the most probable or the typical value will go to zero and that we will see in our calculation while average density of state will stay finite no matter what. 
right? And indeed, this is what we see. This is for weak disorder when average and typical are about the same as expected because at this regime, you still have self-averaging satisfied and most probable and average values are about the same. However, as you increase interactions disorder strengths, you see that the typical density of states starts to be get suppressed and it starts to become zero starting from the edges as expected because localization is happening first at the edges. And then as you increase disorder strengths farther, typical density of states get suppressed. Okay, so one can do this analysis uh, for different cluster size, right? And as shown here on the top right, and extract the critical value of disorder at which metal insulator transition happens. So this is a regime where typical density of state at the band center is completely vanished, right? So this is a result showing this for different cluster sizes. And you can see on the inset, starting from cluster right, uh, 27, we roughly converge of the critical value of disorder strengths about which we don't see minor changes. But obviously you can see that this critical uh, value of critical disorder strength uh, is a st has strong cluster size effects. So non-local uh, correlations are absolutely important to take into account when study Anderson localization in this model. You can also look at the disorder frequency phase diagram, uh, which uh, for different cluster size and compare this with a transfer metric method. So this is the exact method uh, to benchmark our a typical medium approach. And we again see that going beyond single, a single site approximation is absolutely crucial for capturing like this uh, re-entrance behavior, which is completely missing in a single site approximation. Okay, so uh, we have made some efforts to extend this typical medium analysis also to real materials. So this has been done in collaboration with Veiku and my collaborator Tom Berlin from Oak Ridge and Yijan. This method have been applied to iron-based superconductors and also intermediate band semiconductors, where we find uh, for this system, we find a good agreement with experiment where uh, one would expect localization of the intermediate band. For iron-based superconductors, we didn't see any signatures of localization for such system, despite a, a, a big uh, impurities uh, effect of, of iron vacancies. I also want to, um, I don't have much time to go through much details, but I would like to mention that uh, these efforts of treating Anderson localization and disorder in real materials are uh, now actually uh, uh, pursued in other collaborations that I'm uh, taking part of and so-called must collaboration. So we have a YouTube channel if there are many interesting lecture related, lectures related to disorder and strong correlations. And we have a GitHub if you're interested in downloading the uh, um, the program and running it for your system, uh, please uh, uh, feel free uh, to, to visit the website. And finally, I would like to mention there are some ongoing efforts to in, in our group to uh, study the interplay of both disorder plus interaction. So initially we look at the effect of interaction of Anderson uh, on the Anderson transition, this is shown here, which shows that once you take into account uh, interaction between electrons, they lead to the screening effect and the metal in Anderson metal insulated transition starts to happen at larger values of uh of uh, disorder. Uh, one can ask the opposite question, what is the effect of disorder on mod metal insulator transition? And this is very similar to what we have seen in extended Hubbard model, where once you put non-local interaction, screening happens, and one has to go through the finite slope of critical value of U at which metal insulator transition happen, again, indicating strong uh, screening effects. And recently in collaboration with Herbert Ford, so Mr. V incorporated CPA and DMFT in non equilibrium systems where, for example, here we show that once you introduce no, uh, disorder, you can go from more insulated to a metal uh, by introducing disorder into the system. So uh, we also have some efforts because now we have this machinery uh, to detect localization effects. So we are looking also at um, a superconductor Anderson insulated transition. Previous studies have shown that there is some non-local, there is some um, uh, log normal distribution of the superconducting or the parameter indicating the typical approach might be useful to employ here. So we are looking at, at this problem. And uh, 
it has been already one hour. Uh, so I would like to finish with this conclusion side. Uh, so I, today I, I have shown you that quantum materials offer tremendous opportunities for research and uh, they offer tremendous opportunities for emergence of exotic states of matter, which are not interesting just from a theoretical point of view, but also for technological application. I have demonstrated you that there have been significant efforts in the community to study the correlations effect in the system because this is very non-trivial problem by exploring and developing new numerical techniques. And in today's story, I demonstrate you how using one of such techniques, dynamical cluster approximation, we can study one of the central phenomena in quantum materials, electron localization. I have shown you how DCA can capture properly capture electron localization in mode system, a charge ordering, as well as disorder driven Anderson localization. And with this, I finish and I thank you for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice uh, talk that gives uh, both a very broad perspective and some state-of-the-art uh, results that I found very um, interesting. So I'll start with questions here in, in Sherbrooke. Good. Thank you for this very nice talk. I Just a very naive and general question about the disorder models. We, you presented mainly two models. Basically, you have this side disorder with some distribution. And then you have the binary, which is I guess, more extreme case. Uh, could you comment? Um, and of course, we could think of others, right? I mean, you ha you could have hopping disorder and all yes. kinds. Of yes. So, in in your opinion, physically in real materials, I mean, do you expect that these two are enough, or do you need different models at all? Or what's the most realistic way of looking at disorder in 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 general? Is it just is the side disorder enough? because it's probably the easiest way to look at it, or do you need something else? Yes, very good question. I think it depends on the material. For semiconductors, uh, binary or alloy system, uh, binary uh, is definitely uh, is likely enough. Uh, for example, the recent studies, I think this is from UC Davis, they have looked at uh, nanoparticles and they find that uh, uh, hoping disorder is very important. So I think the answer is it really depends. There are also some systems where uh, I didn't uh, I didn't present it here, but for example, if you want to go to more realistic system, you have to take into account that once you change local potential, it not only changes the potential, but it also changes how hopping between electron happens. So it's so-called off off diagonal disorder. Uh, so definitely once you go to to realistic systems, this needs to be taken into account. Yeah, okay, thank you. Another question from someone else here. Hello, thank you for the nice presentation. So I had a small question on the techniques that you use to actually solve the problems because you had many plots with the, where you compare the system size or the cluster size. So some were like very large. So I was wondering like, how can you afford so large cluster calculations and uh, to what cost actually? Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, for 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 Haber models that I presented, uh, uh, running on HPC uh, HPCs, uh, this is not difficult. This is not the real space cluster where you have to invert matrices. So this is really. Uh, not that uh, it's doable, uh, but for disordered system, I presented you these are really big clusters, but these are non-interacting systems, so it's very easy to do actually. Once you put interaction into account, this will be much more challenging. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, um, can you show your plot uh, phase diagram where you add the V and U mm -hmm, mm -hmm. order? Yeah. Yeah, this one, yes. So I find that, that uh, this is very interesting uh, result that indeed in the charge ordered state, you recover quasi-particles in some sense, the self-energy uh, is fermi liquid like and then in the mud insulator, it's uh, diverging. So my question is, let's say you sit at uh, U equals six here, mm. then you raise the, the, the V. Yeah. Uh, what happens is there a first order transition where the self energy comes from infinite to zero? How does it occur? Oh, you're asking a very good question. Unfortunately, um, this is a regime because you have large U and large V. Once you introduce large V, you have very severe sign problem. 
So I couldn't answer your question very clearly. I have a lot of noise. Sign problem becomes very, very bad. So I think the results from EDMFT community, EDMFT plus GW, they have shown that you have some first order transition once you go to these larger values of U. I think this is work by um, Thomas Adel, um, uh, Matthias Troy, and uh, yeah, this that group for EDMFT. But unfortunately, and uh, Marie, I cannot answer you clearly here because numerics becomes very noisy there. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting for high temperature superconductors because. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you know, at high temperature, it looks like it's going to be insulating, and then you get charge order, and then you get quantum oscillations. So, yeah, that, that's sort of uh, yeah what's expected, but it's nice uh, nice to see it in a yes calculation. We need, we need to tackle that as a way to uh, to uh, reduce sign problem was introduced by V. Yes. In this regime, which is interesting. <laughs> Okay, more questions? Uh, oui, Alexandre. So uh, in order to deal with um, disorder, you introduced this typical averaging. Uh, and I, I wonder, is, is there some compromise made uh, when doing that? Is there some phenomena that would not be recovered correctly when doing that sort of? Uh, oh, well, I see, very, very good question. By the way, I didn't mention this because I didn't have time, but this typical, um, this this log normal distribution that I have shown you this has been actually measured experimentally as well. So uh, by uh, Alias Dani group, where they look at the probability distribution function of the local density of states, which changes with disorder. But back to your question, a uh, very good point. When, when I calculate typical density of state. It's not the actual density of state. So if I calculate density by integrating this uh, density of electrons from by integrating this, it's not going to be giving me a, a true density of electrons. So this is just a machinery to identify either mobility edges or whether the system is localized or not. Okay. So there is. Uh, so this is one of the things uh, when applying this approach to. Uh, to real materials, one also has to be careful about this uh, because, again, if you want to do charge self-consistency loop, you have to really make sure that you calculate the actual density of states and not the one obtained from the typical density of states. Okay. I'm going to okay. um, I'm going to ask a question from uh, uh, maybe a, a user of DFT. Okay. Um, so often when we have the uh, metallic systems and we want to have like make it isolating, like we make a larger cell and we see an anti-paramagnetic anti system building. So anti-paramagnetic system can become insulating within the FT. I didn't see you looking at these anti-paramagnetic phases. No, 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 this is paramagnetic case. This is fully paramagnetic case. Okay. Yes. Yes, we are not. We we suppress antiferromagnetism, so we have spin up and spin down symmetric. But you do still have W occupied site. Yes, yes, but it's a. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. You but can suppress the... this in your solution of DMFT. <laughs> antiferromagnetism. You can put symmetry and say, okay, this is fully unfrustrated system. Okay. But in the D gamma A, you, you showed the. Uh, yes, in D gamma A, it's a different story. Yes. But uh, this D gamma A is just to show where the origin is coming from. Uh, yes. Yes, it's clear that even if you enforce paramagnetism, if the system is big enough, it will have uh, local antiferromagnetic correlations. Yes. Yes. They will, they will dominate the, the, the structure factor. It, it will just rotate basically so that the average is zero, but the correlations will will be there. So what's interesting is to look at the frustrated lattice then to see. As right. you... <laughs> okay. Okay. So I guess uh, we're all done. So thank you again for this uh, very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you so much for having me.